the Supermarine Spitfire became a World War II icon after it successfully defended England in the Battle of Britain. Today we're going to take this freeware version out for a quick demo flight and tutorial on some of the quirks and features. Welcome to RAF Northolt, just north of London. This is the oldest operating RAF base, it used to be part of the Royal Flying Corps. It's been around since 1915. Uh, I should say it's the oldest continually used, according to the internet. And so it seemed like an appropriate place today to try out this freeware Spitfire. This is the Spitfire HF Mark 9 M70. The HF means it is a high altitude model, so it's got a slightly uh, different engine for that purpose. I'm not certain I haven't played with all of the ones that came with it, if it really flies that different. So here we go, here's the free download at the xplane.org. And you'll notice each of the models we have, I'm gonna scroll through them there. Uh, basically, we have the regular version, we have the high altitude version, we have full wing versions, and we have clipped wing versions. Um, obviously, today I'm using the high altitude, and I'm not using one with drop tanks. So, uh, quite a few things to play with here for a free aircraft. All right, so let's check out this model. Interestingly enough, I already mentioned the HF stands for high altitude, but this livery is the livery of an actual surviving and flying Spitfire. So built in 1944, serving the 183rd Squadron and then moved to the 234th, uh, Foxtrot X-Ray Mike was restored in 1992, painted back to its 234th Squadron registration and it's still flying air shows today known as the Kent Spitfire. So uh, we'll flash up there a little screenshot of their web page and you can go check that out. The one thing you'll notice uh, on their website is the stripes on the wings are not reflected in this livery. So that is uh, one difference and even the uh, stripes on the empennage we've only got one white and they've got uh, three whites and two blacks. But uh, regardless it's a living, breathing, real Spitfire. So we're going to mix start procedure with some cockpit layout items here. First off, we have a canopy lever, so flick that and the canopy does retract. You'll notice the glass is a little bit tinted there. Uh, the canopy would obviously be open for better airflow on the ground and ventilation, as well as being able to stick your head out to uh, assess things like uh, the flaps. Although I'm not, you know, it said that in the documentation. I'm not sure if you can actually see the flaps uh, around the wing from there. So your left hand would control the throttle and the prop speed. Here's our iconic circular yoke. On the right side, we have our gear lever and some fuel systems there. Most of what we're going to be paying attention to is on this center panel. We do have a gun sight adjustment. I'm just going to point this out. It's probably not something you're going to use, but it's there. So we've got most of our basic equipment. And if you want to do a little more complex navigational work, you can throw the switch and jump immediately to a modernized panel. And basically, you're going to add um, some autopilot functions and a lot of radio nav functions you didn't have with that knot there. So at the top, we've got transponder, common nav radios. We have this uh, HSI that pops up instead of just the compass. So that's a little easier to use. Over on the far left are some autopilot features. But most importantly, in the center, just under that HSI, an aileron trim. Very useful, going to help you overcome the uh, P factor on this aircraft. So uh, just to get it all trimmed out and not have to constantly hold the ailerons. 
All right, so let's go through up the uh, startup procedure as the documentation says. First, it tells us the fuel cock should be on. It does default on, so there it is. All right, next, we're just checking that the magnetos are off, and they are off. Throttle a half inch to one inch open, so we have some fuel for the engine when we start it. Uh, your guess is as good as mine what an inch is. That looks like an inch to me, but, you know, it's a sim cockpit. I don't really know. Okay, prop speed, full forwards, so we'll run that to full forwards. All right, next, the idle cutoff control. It's this little ring here. It's pulled fully aft by default, and it should be fully aft at this point, so check. All right, moving along, they want the booster pump on for 30 seconds, but it occurred to me the battery's not on, so that pump isn't going to do anything. Uh, it was not in the documentation list to turn on the battery, but kind of one of those obvious things, so turn on the battery. If you're going to print out this list like I did, I recommend you just write that item in where you want it to be. All right, so uh, once the boost pump's been on, in theory we have the pressure we need to start the engine. I do believe I've tried starting the engine without that step, and I think it was fine. So next, turn the boost pump back off, and then we'll be moving the idle cutoff control, that ring, to full forwards. It's basically your, uh, your mixture control, so we're going essentially rich there. All right, so the magnetos need to be turned on. Click both of those on. At this point, we're ready for a start. Press the starter. You don't have to hold it for very long, surprisingly. There we go. Engine is running. Jump outside. Check it out. Beautiful. Beautiful aircraft. Beautiful model. All right, so they would like us to warm up the engine at an RPM of about 1,000 to 1,200. And that's about where we are with our half inch to one inch of throttle anyway. The warm up period is actually just for the oil. And so uh, we'll look at the oil temp in a minute. They want you to check that the fuel pressure light is off. And once you verify that, turn the boost pump back on. All right, so the oil temp, at least 15 Celsius, you can see we're well over that. So you can consider, consider us warmed up at this point and ready to go. The model's pretty forgiving in that, uh, in that regard. This little tab here operates the flaps. Um, if you link it to a joystick like I have, you'll get full flaps or no flaps. But that tab can actually be run incrementally if you use the mouse. And you could have uh, varying degrees of flaps at your own desire. So maybe we'll demonstrate that here in just a moment. Let's just pull this tab a little bit. There we go, we'll just call that about 20%. And as you can see, the flaps have only partially deployed. There, I toggled the joystick. They fully deployed. Toggle again, fully retract. All right, so that's just sort of a system check item. Now we're just going to check these magnetos. Deactivating one at a time, only one. You'll watch for a drop in RPMs. You don't want to see too much of a drop, or you might have a bad magneto. So try the other one. We're actually at, still at idle, so this is probably not really the appropriate power setting for magneto check, but the documentation said to do it. All right, so this is what the documentation says to do next. Open up to zero pounds per square inch. I will tell you right now, that's why it says warning, this is going to end in a catastrophe. So, this is actually a pretty decent amount of power. Uh, when the, the boost uh, zeroes out, you'll feel the plane moving. Now, you see I just just slightly moved that prop speed. Boom, over we go. So, um, yeah. <laughs> it wants you to run the prop speed through its full range of motion just to test it. You can't do that 
at uh, zero boost. It's just too much power. Or I did something wrong. So if you know what I did wrong, and it's me and not the documentation, uh, leave it in the comments. So maybe we'll try that same test here with the engine at idle. And now the prop speed can be run through its course without flipping the aircraft on its nose. All right, so bringing the power back up to uh, boost level of zero. I'm gonna check those magnetos now, more proper run up. Still no huge dip on either left or right, so those magnetos look good. Come back to idle. I guess one of the main things you're gonna find you need to be very careful with with the Spitfire is uh, not treating it like a uh, Cessna. This is a very high performance aircraft and it has uh, just so much power that you can get yourself into trouble and not realize it. Oh, real quick, some other things uh, that weren't on that documentation. Turn on the generator. You're going to have an electrical warning up there. If you don't, it'll be red. And uh, nav lights, that's kind of at your, uh, that's at your desire. You know, military aircraft use lights a little different than civil. So, uh, depends how you want to simulate this, if you're going to use the lights or not. I have the nav lights only on. All right, so we're ready to taxi. Obviously, this is a tail dragger, conventional gear. So the uh, CG is very different than it would be with tricycle gear. So we need to be just a little more aware and a little more cautious as we taxi out. Winds are light and variable, so I'm headed to the nearest most runway threshold. Pull that altimeter setting off the map just to uh, save time and radio tuning. So there's our departure runway. Our altimeter is set. You'll notice uh, we don't have a very good viewpoint looking out front. I, I've programmed an elevated viewpoint, but now I've got this exterior view set. Uh, I believe I programmed this to be five on my number pad because this is how I prefer to taxi. I know I'm cheating, I'm cheating, but uh, it comes out a lot better that way. I also have some glance left and right set up. I have uh, four and six set to look off the left wing and the right wing, and seven and nine set to be kind of uh, forward left and forward right looking, just to make it a little simpler. So very gingerly on the throttle, doesn't need much power to get things moving. This aircraft has not given me trouble with uh, doing ground loops, which is something that is very easy to do with a tail dragger. But you will find you need to taxi at a very modest speed. You can see how close to the center line both of those uh, main gears are. So as a result, if you try and navigate a turn at a high rate of speed you're gonna tip it over and uh, I actually demonstrate that later in the video for you so there we go again you can't really see too much off the nose as I understand it doing little s turns is something that would normally be done in a tail dragger to help you see what's directly ahead of you you can see I'm already getting into trouble just glancing off to the side there for a moment. We're slightly into the grass, so let's go back to the external. So the takeoff procedures, as listed in the documentation, they want us to have that uh, prop speed full forwards. So that's pretty normal. Fuel tanks on main, we haven't messed with that, so that's fine. The booster pump's on, we never turned it off. The flaps up, and we have the flaps up. And then the procedure they're describing is to use plus four on the boost. The boost starts uh, on that dial you'll see in a moment, minus four, zero, plus four. I think it goes up to about eight. Um, basically, less is going to be more on takeoff. You have very little control authority on the rudder or the ailerons when the aircraft is not moving or at a very slow speed and the P factor and prop wash this engine can put out is incredible uh, so if you're not really ready for it you're gonna find it's gonna just yaw incredibly to the left and actually want to start to flip itself over 
and you can just get behind it very easily. So I recommend you take off uh, at a very modest throttle, and once you're airborne, then you can firewall it without much difficulty. Now I will say as I played with this more and more, I've found I'm able to take off at a much higher power setting because I can just sort of anticipate what's happening better, but uh, it, it does come off a little sloppy. So keep an eye on the boost. We're gonna go back to the internal shot here in a moment. We're lined up and ready to go. So the boost is over here on the right. Just watch that. You can see we're just below negative four. I'm going to bring it up to maybe negative two, maybe zero. And I'm going to keep an eye on it. Bear in mind that boost does change as we pick up speed. So it's not like you're going to set a uh, fixed boost. I am going to hold back. So I've got the joystick full back that's raised the elevator, and that's going to help force the tail down. If I don't do that, the tail's going to come up very quickly. We have almost no authority at these low speeds, and so the aircraft is going to start rolling and twisting with the P-factor and the torque and the crop wash, and uh, you probably won't be able to recover it. As you can see, we're just below zero on the boost. It's pretty gentle. We're going to use a little bit of rudder. Still have that elevator up. This is a very leisurely takeoff. We could use more power, but I will tell you until you get used to this, probably better off. Now, once you feel it lifting up, you pretty much fire wall it. Took me a little second there to recover from uh, that yawing to the left. Safely up, so we'll retract the gear. So once you get airborne, you're going to notice it's very responsive, uh, as a fighter aircraft should be. But it really wants to roll left. So there you go. I just let go of the yoke. You can see it, it's pretty. It looks like I'm just initiating a turn. So here we go. Let's open up that modern panel and adjust the aileron trim. I'm just gonna keep holding it until it stops rolling itself. So I'm bringing myself back to level. I don't just wanna sit on it and wait for it to come back right because then I've, I've exceeded what I need. We want kind of a neutral setting there. All right, so now that we're trimmed out, life is good. It's gonna be much easier to fly. And we can get rid of that modern panel because I like the classic look. And I'm not going to do any real modern navigation with this today. All right, one kind of weird thing. The airspeed is indicated in miles per hour, and it's a uh, sort of a doubled up gauge there where once it rolls over and is reading, you know, it's spun the whole way around, then you're on to the inner dial for the higher airspeeds. And that shouldn't be too confusing because... Uh, I don't think you're going to mistake yourself at that high airspeed for accidentally being at the number indicated on the outer ring. So this aircraft, very fun and aerobatic. You can do loops, you can do rolls. Uh, it's going to snap left easier than right because of the engine uh, direction. I found it very forgiving and just absolutely fun to play with, so I would suggest if you just want a fun aircraft to just kind of uh, bomb around in, you can put this thing on full throttle once you're in the air, get it trimmed out, and just absolutely have a blast. Now, since it is a fighter aircraft, fortunately, that is simulated. We have guns and cannons, so let's mess around with the guns first. The barrels are built into the wings. You can actually see, see it firing there. It's pretty sweet, isn't it? Very, very nice. Uh, if you just get bored, you can turn on live traffic, uh, find an approach, and go chasing down airliners with it. It doesn't do anything to them, but it gives you a target that moves. 
Now the cannons are a little more interesting. Uh, this is probably not realistic, and I'm not really sure what they mean by cannons versus guns, if this is just a much higher caliber round. But for whatever reason, uh, they explode when they hit the ground here. And since we're turning, you're not seeing the imp There we go, there's the impact. I'll give you the external footage here in just a moment. But uh, isn't that great if we fly through the debris? So again, you can have a ton of fun with this. The ammo is not unlimited, so uh, don't go crazy. All right, let's, uh, let's see that from the outside. Again, very, very maneuverable. Just inverted and just pulling through. Look at those explosions. There's certainly nothing... Uh, I can't imagine what, what sort of uh, incendiary round you could have that would put off that big of a fireball. I'm sure that's complete and absolute nonsense, but it looks great, so who cares? All right, so we talked a little bit about the quirks of taking off, and now let's talk about landing. I'm going to admit right now, this took me forever to figure out. I even went on to the uh, Facebook forum for uh, X-Plane, where we're pretty active, and solicited the help of numerous sim captains, and they came through for me and helped me figure it out. So here's what the uh, documentation says to do. Reduce speed to 160 miles per hour. Uh, you can slide open the hood and check, undercarriage down, prop control. Uh, I'm actually not even going to bother with the prop control, that wasn't that important. Fuel, booster pump, flaps down. Let's talk about the part that is important. Let's do the uh, flaps down speeds here. It says engine assisted, 115. It said final approach speeds. Let's consider that to be more of a touchdown speed. I mean, if you're thinking of it like I'm flying on final and you're at 115, this thing is going to be falling out of the air, and so uh, that is not, for me, something I found successful. I wasn't able to fly it at that speed. All right, so these are speeds at which the airfield boundary is crossed. The initial straighting approach should be 20 to 25 higher. I, I agree with that statement. So uh, 20 to 25 higher, so you're looking uh, 135, 140. I would say 130 is actually pretty good. So you can see what I was having happen here. Bounce. Main problem, I came in very shallow. And so I was maintaining uh, a, a good speed. However, I wasn't able to bleed it off. And I, so I touched down on the main gear. And then we got that terrible bounce. And it was a sloppy mess after that. So this time, I tried coming in. And I've got more of that... Uh, the speed is lower, so you can see we have an approach vertically that makes more sense. But the problem is still going to be I'm going to hit on that main gear, and we're going to get a bounce. So just try and visualize where the center of gravity is behind that gear, and this bounce actually kind of makes more sense because we impact the ground, and all of the weight behind the gear wants to come down too. So uh, here, here's two more just to kind of finish this disaster off. But what I was trying was not working. So here are the tips I got from the fine, fine sim pilots over on the uh, Facebook X-Plane forum. I'm going to approach faster, about 130. I'm going to stay higher to keep the runway in sight. At the threshold, I'm going to reduce the throttle and kind of dive down, tip the nose down. Then we're going to flare and try and hold off touching down we want to get the nose up, an angle of attack, similar, actually pretty much basically what we had on our takeoff roll, uh, and that's going to be what our three-point landing needs to be. So when we come in for the three-point landing, uh, what that means is we want both mains and the tail wheel to come down and touch at the same time. Oh, I put uh, trim after gear and flaps, it's a very important reminder, because uh, once you add that drag, got new forces in play and you don't want to be fighting those forces plus trying to figure out how to land so trim yourself up once those are once those are uh, set and so here you can see we're staying fairly high you see the air speeds about 130 we are descending if you look at the vertical rate And we'll 
and uh, pick out kind of a reference point because as we get closer I'm going to try and keep the nose up and I'm gonna lose sight of that threshold so it looks like we've got kind of a road coming through the town and once we cross that road we're gonna be just about to the airport property all right we lost a little speed we're gonna try and bring it back up to hold 130 Vertical rate is zeroed out, so we're flying level right now. Here comes that visual reference of the road. We're approaching it. So once I get up here, then we'll start kind of nosing down for the runway. Still, we're staying above that 115. Consider that more of your touchdown speed. So anywhere in the 120 to 130 here has been working pretty nicely for me. And if you know, uh, if you know something I don't about doing this, I have any tips, again, leave it in the comments. I'd love to see it. Now that we're almost down, I'm going to try and get the nose up for that three-point attitude. And then we'll start drawing back the throttle. When I nosed up, I was holding back on the stick. Don't give any of the stick back. Just keep it back and you'll just keep losing speed and lowering to the ground. If you let some of it come forwards, whatever you let come forwards, you can consider that uh, building bounce energy. Oh, remember I told you not to turn too fast? There's your demonstration. So, uh, other than that turn and mashing my wing, we had a pretty smooth touchdown there. Maybe the tiniest of bounces let's check it on the external go back over what for me has been my procedure here flying 120 to 130 indicated miles per hour staying a little higher than we would in the tricycle gear I know I'm not really at the threshold I'm already diving down and then here comes that flare bringing the nose up watch the elevator See, once I brought it back, I just held it there. It floated down, and pretty much stuck to the ground, and that's exactly what we wanted. And then I should have really bled off some more speed. Uh, I will mention, obviously, if you, if you haven't done a tail dragger yet, you cannot just mash on the brakes. You'll just tip it up on its nose like you saw earlier when we had that unfortunate uh, prop speed test. So now that we're back on the ground, I guess it's a good time to wrap up this video. I'm not too uh, ashamed to tell you this has taken me the longest to learn of uh, any aircraft this size. Just taking off and landing was a real pain for me and I even needed help. So I hope you'll go out, fly it, and let us know how you did. Again, we're the Flight Brothers. Don't forget to plan the flight and fly the plane.